Yes, um, we have been making our way through the book of Revelation together for 12 weeks. This is week 12, and um, just kind of going our slowly, chapter by chapter, uh, trying to make sense of the images and just the different symbols that go that go on in the book of Revelation, and then, you know, what does that mean for us. So hopefully you've been enjoying it. I've been really enjoying teaching it. Um, but uh, so just to, as a way to just remind us, um, Revelation, you know, the last book of the Bible is uh, a prophetic book of the Bible, uh, but it's also a letter to seven real churches that existed in uh, Asia Minor in the first century, and we read about that in chapters 2 and 3. So it's this, this whole book was a letter that was passed around to um, different churches. And the book of Revelation is also uh, an apocalypse, meaning um, apocalyptic literature. Um, basically, what it does is it attempts to pull back the veil uh, and show us things as they really are. So the book of Revelation is really unique because it's these three, these three things. It's a prophetic book of the Bible. It's a letter. It's an apocalyptic book. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's just a very unique book of the Bible. So I've been teaching uh, from the vantage point that the book of Revelation is not strictly a future book like I don't hold a futurist view of the book of Revelation that you know it's a chronological description of a literal seven-year tribulation right before Jesus returns um, I've been teaching from a, a different kind of vantage point that the book of Revelation describes much of what takes place between Jesus's first and second coming um, and so we've kind of seen that as we've gone um, along. And so uh, there is movement in the book of Revelation towards the return of Jesus. But I don't think that we should necessarily read the book of Revelation chronologically. And what I mean by that is, you know, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Because apocalyptic literature is not meant to be read um, chronologically. Uh, because a lot, and we're going to get into that tonight, uh, uh, some of what John does. A and just because John says, then I saw this and then I saw this, doesn't mean that that's necessarily what happens next. That's just what he saw, right? He's seeing these series of, of visions. So I I'm he I've heard from lots of you that uh, most of us probably grew up with the left behind, you know, uh, view kind of, if you've read those novels of the book of Revelation, and there are other ways to view this book of the Bible, so it's been good. Uh, oh, hi, Megan, and I'm assuming Austin, too, and um, hi, Dawn and Joy watching on the website. That's great. So last week, um, we, just to kind of catch you up, we looked at chapter 14 all the way up until chapter 15, verse 4, and that whole section is, you know, the message of these three angels um, and then the harvest of the earth, essentially. And so we saw, um, we saw these uh, three angels delivering these three messages, delivering the gospel, right? And really what they were proclaiming was judgment on the beast, judgment on those who worship the beast, uh, and then, you know, after those three angels, we see yet again another call for the church to endure, and it's a call to be faithful till the end. And I hope what you've noticed is, I think almost in every single chapter, um, there is some type of call to, to uh, followers of Jesus to endure to the end. It's like, that is the main theme of the book of Revelation, be faithful till the end, endure till the end. Uh, and so, yet again, in chapter 14, there's this call to the endurance of the saints. Um, you know, make it till the end. Be faithful. Uh, and then we saw Jesus harvest the earth, right? An angel comes and says, put out your sickle, reap 
And so Jesus harvests the earth, and we talked about how that was representing um, salvation, that Jesus, uh, you know, harvests the earth, uh, representing people being saved. And then the very end of chapter 14, um, we saw... Um, this harvest of the vine of the earth. And, you know, you read about it and it talks about how, you know, the, the, the grapes are harvested, they're thrown into the wine press of God's wrath and the wine press is trodden outside the city and then the blood flows from the wine press as high as a horse's uh, bridle for 1600 stadia. And it was just really uh, graphic language being used. Uh, And so most scholars we talked about, I shouldn't say most, lots of scholars believe that this is the end time judgment. And so what uh, they believe the end of chapter 14 is showing is God taking all the unbelievers, basically putting him in the wine press of his wrath and there's just blood and gore and God's judging unbelievers. But um, we talked about this last week. Perhaps though, it's actually describing Jesus, because uh, in the Old Testament, the, the phrase, the vine of the earth or the imagery of a vineyard is always used to describe Israel. And then you get to Jesus, his teaching, and he is represented as the true Israel. He says, I am the true vine. And so, you know, we talked about how Jesus was crucified outside of the city. Uh, and at, as he's crucified, the wrath of God is being poured out onto him. And his blood covers people. And so we kind of said, you know, there's a possibility that it's not describing God, you know, throwing all of these unbelievers and their blood pouring out everywhere. It could actually be describing uh, what Jesus went through to save people. So, uh, and then last week's section was bookended, right? The beginning of chapter 14. And the first few verses of chapter 15, it's just kind of bookended with um, descriptions, pictures of the people of God, right? The 144,000, those who have been sealed at the beginning of chapter 14. Then it talks about, again, those who have conquered the beast and they're standing around the throne and they're worshiping God. So it really was uh, just a beautiful uh, picture of God's people. So now, tonight, we want to look at the section from uh, chapter 15, verse 5, up until the, the whole of chapter 16, essentially. So this section is commonly called um, the seven bowls or the seven plagues. Um, it's called both of those things um, of God's wrath, essentially. So you'll remember that we've seen two other groups of seven. We've seen seven seals. Um, That was back in chapter six, I believe. And then we saw seven uh, trumpets, which was in chapters, you know, uh, eight and nine. And now we're seeing seven bowls. So three groups of seven. So what I want to do then is um, read Revelation chapter 15, verse 5, uh, all the way till the end of chapter 16, and we'll make a few kind of initial observations, and then um, we'll just kind of walk through each of these bowls and what they mean and some of the imagery that is used. So before I read, I'll just remind you as we kind of go along, I'm trying to monitor all the the comments, but it, as we go along, if you have questions that come up or comments that you want to make or you want me to uh, clarify things, um, you can just type that in there. There is probably like a 10, 15 um, second delay, so when you type something, it might, I might answer it l- later on because there is a little bit of a delay. So, um, let's just dive in. Revelation chapter 15, verse 5, and then we'll go all the way until the end of chapter 16, all seven bowls. So, uh, 
Follow along if you have a Bible at home, and I'll just read it. It says, After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds." The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, though he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones about 100 pounds each fell from heaven on people and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So um, needless to say, uh, very intense uh, section of the book of Revelation, very dark and there's a lot of heavy um, judgment and wrath talk. And we're going to get into all that. But, you know, there's sores and fire and all this kind of stuff. And so it's kind of a, a very sobering section of the book of Revelation. Like I said, there's t- talk of plagues and wrath and darkness. And there's a lot of imagery that is being used um, in this section. So... This whole, this whole section, uh, chapter 15, verse 5, all the way until the end of chapter 16 is kind of bracketed by the word wrath and by the idea of something being finished or done. So in, in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 1, um, John says uh, he saw seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last 
for with them the wrath of God is finished. So there's this uh, idea at the beginning of chapter 15 that these are the last, it's finished, the wrath of God. And then if you go to the very end, or near the very end, right, the seventh bowl and the angel who pours out the seventh bowl says what? It is done, right? This last bowl of God's wrath. So there's this, um, there's this sense of like finality to this section. Now, I want, I want to remind you about God's wrath. Um, we often view wrath as emotional, illogical anger. When we think of like human beings uh, displaying wrath, um, it's often seen as just like a heightened emotional, sometimes even illogical anger at something. Um, but God's wrath is not a intense emotional flare-up, which we ho- humans are known for. God's wrath is not just irrational uh, passion. God's wrath is his strong and settled position to all that is evil. Uh, one scholar, he said, God's wrath is a burning zeal for uh, the right or goodness or righteousness coupled with a perfect hatred for everything that's evil. So there's nothing illogical or like overly emotional about God's wrath. It's just his settled position on, on evil, on his intense hatred of everything that is evil. So when we talk about God's wrath, um, God's wrath is always just. And it's his position on evil. And it, I think if anything... What chapter 16 shows us is that God takes sin and evil um, very seriously. So we got to remember that as we go through. It's not as if God's throwing a hissy fit, right, when he pours these bowls out. Um, God is perfectly just, and his wrath is just his anger at evil and sin and wickedness. So before we just... Uh, walk through each of these bowls, um, just a couple of things to help us make sense of all of this. Because like I said, there's stuff in here that you go like, what? There's frogs coming out of people's mouths, and there's, you know, so a couple of things to, to remind us of. I want us to, rem- to remind us of the use of symbols in the book of Revelation, and we've seen that already in these first, you know, 14 chapters. Um, apocalyptic literature, which Revelation is, uses symbolism and imagery to, um, to show the reality behind and beyond the symbol. So let, remember, apocalypse literally means uh, pulling back the veil. It's an unveiling. And so it's as if... Um, the book of Revelation, John is kind of using these symbols and he's pulling back the veil and he's saying, hey, this is actually what's going on. This is the spiritual reality that I'm trying to convey with the use of these images and symbols. So just as a, as a reminder, like in chapter, Revelation chapter 5, John turns, right, and he's, expected, he's expecting to see Jesus, but he sees what? A lamb who was slain with seven horns and seven eyes. So you kind of go, well, that's a bizarre picture. Now, did John, did John literally see uh, a bloodied lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? Like when you and I get to heaven, um, is Jesus going to be a literal lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? Well, no. And so that image that symbol is meant to convey things right when we get to heaven we'll see jesus who is completely powerful which is what seven horns represents and jesus who is completely wise which is what seven eyes represents that's what those symbols mean right that's what they're they're pointing to so it's like john uses these symbols and he's trying to point to a greater reality. And so we've seen that all along, right? We interpret the book of Revelation as apocalyptic literature. What do these symbols represent? What do they mean? So 
When, when John in chapter 16 sees seven bowls of God's wrath, I don't think necessarily that it means that you and I go looking for seven angels who are holding seven literal bowls filled with, you know, awful stuff, right? Chapter 16 is a symbolic representation of the awful reality of judgment. It's God enacting his justice. And so, I, you know, are there literally bowls that, you know, are holding God's wrath? Well, no, that, that doesn't have to be. That's just a symbol of what, of what John sees to describe um, the reality behind it, if that makes sense. So that's one thing. Keep in mind, right, that the use of images, that's really important for us as we study this book. It's, um, it helps make sense of it. Secondly, the setting of this scene is really interesting. Um, in verse 5 of chapter 15, it says, uh, John says, After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Um, other translations, your translation might say, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. Um, it, it means the same thing. So we want to ask, well, why is that significant? So John sees the sanctuary of the tent of witness or, you know, the temple of the tabernacle in heaven opened. So um, the tent of witness in the Old Testament uh, contained the stone tablets which the Ten Commandments were written on. That's where they put, right, in the Ark of the Covenant, in the temple, or um, in the tent of witness. And so what that meant was those Ten Commandments witnessed to the abiding demand of God's moral law. So it, it's really interesting to me that this scene takes place in the temple of of the tabernacle or the tent of witness and so what we see is angels holding bowls of God's wrath they're coming out of the sanctuary and so really what I think that's meant to kind of signify is that the pouring out of the bowls is the outworking of natural consequences of violating God's moral law like when humanity violates God's law we're actually going against the way that we were created to live and how things in the universe were actually meant to work. And so it, it naturally leads to just terrible outcomes. And so when we do that, right, when you and I go against, when, when humanity goes against God's moral law, we ruin ourselves and we ruin creation as well. So I think that's interesting, right, that this this. This whole scene takes place in the tent of witness or out of the tent of witness where God's moral law was kept. And so it's almost like it's saying, look what happens when you go against the way that the universe was actually created to run and how God created things to work. And the tent of meeting um, was where God met his people, right, in the desert, um, as they, they, they wandered, that's where God's presence came and that's where he met with his people. And so it's almost as if these bowls are just the natural, automatic reflex of God's perfect holiness and justice. So I think that's important for us to remember, the setting of, of where all this is taking place. Um, thirdly, these seven bowls are related to the seven trumpets and the seven seals. Um, it's as if, and I, if you've watched for, you know, the whole time, you'll know that I've said this before, but it's as if the seven bowls are a third go-around of the same reality already depicted in the seals and the trumpets. But it's almost as if it's from a different vantage point. Now, the reason I say that is that it's actually quite amazing the amount of overlap between the trumpets and the bowls. So, I'll just, read, so the first trumpet, we read that it affects the earth. The first bowl affects the earth. Uh, the second trumpet, we're told, affects the sea. Uh, the second bowl 
affects the sea. The third trumpet affects the rivers. The third bowl affects the rivers. The fourth trumpet affects the sun. And the fourth bowl affects the sun. The fifth trumpet uh, is against the pit of evil or it affects the pit of evil. And the fifth bowl affects the throne of evil. The sixth trumpet affects the river Euphrates. And the sixth bowl uh, affects the river Euphrates. So they're, they're almost identical. Uh, they completely overlap in how they affect um, d- the world and how they interact with creation. So you kind of go, well, that's interesting. Is that a coincidence, right, that the seven bowls are almost patterned exactly after the seven trumpets? Well, no, I don't think that's a coincidence. So I, I believe that... Um, Oh, good question, Sherry, on on Facebook. I'll answer that in a second. I believe the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are showing us the same reality, but from different perspectives, right? We saw when we walked through the seven seals that that was a perspective from the persecuted church. Uh, And the seven trumpets, I believe, is the perspective from the world, And now what we're seeing is the seven bowls is the perspective from the throne of God. So you have uh, the similar things happening, but from different vantage points. So you have, you know, events and things happening in history from the vantage point of the church who is suffering. And then you have things that happen in history from the vantage point of the world. And then you have things that happen in history from the vantage point of the throne of God. So Sherry asks, would these figurative bowls have been, have been slowly being filled up since Moses got the tablets from God at Mount Sinai? Well, yeah, there's, um, even in Romans, it talks about storing up uh, God's wrath. Um, uh, now I'm not going to be able to find that. But hey, if someone knows that, you can comment that. That verse that talks about um, that you've been storing up the wrath of God. So I think, sure, Sherry, um, the wrath of God is his, his anger at sin and unrighteousness and wickedness. We know that for those who are in Christ Jesus, the wrath of God has been satisfied, right, on the cross. But I, I think um, that you're not wrong, right, as we get closer and closer and closer to the return of Jesus, yes, I think that God's wrath is being stored up to give people a chance to repent and turn to him for sure. So I, I think that the seven bowls are a, a, a different perspective, but are describing, you know, we've seen this before in the seven seals and the seven trumpets. And then lastly, before we walk through, um, we have to be reminded that the book of Revelation uses what is called recapitulation. And so that is a, a, a literary you know, device um, that is super common. Romans 2.5, storing up the wrath of God. Thanks, I was looking at the end of chapter 1. Thanks, Pamela. Romans 2.5 talks about storing up the wrath of God. Um, oh, and Leah said Romans 2.5 as well. Um, Oh, and then there we go. Wow, people are quick. Yes, Romans 2 5. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteousness, well, sorry, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So, yes, that's exactly uh, that, that verse that I was thinking of. So, recapitulation is a literary device that um, apocalyptic literature uses. And what it does is it's, it's like it's describing something and then recapitulation means that it, it doubles back and describes the same thing, right, from a different vantage point. And so we've seen that in the book of Revelation a bunch of times already. John sees a vision and he, the way that he describes it, it feels like, well, this is the end. John's describing the very end. And then the next chapter doubles back and it's like it starts all over again and shares the same thing. So John sees, right, a vision and then the way he describes it, it's like, 
he's describing when Jesus returns and the coming of the new creation. And then all of a sudden you flip to the next chapter and it's like, oh, we've gone back and it looks like we've started all over again. So let me give you a few example, examples. The seven seals, right? It's describing all of these things and it gets more and more and more and more intense, right? The sixth seal, there's an earthquake and it, the, it feels like creation itself is coming apart. And then the eighth, or sorry, the seventh seal in Romans 8.1 says, when the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And so you kind of go, that feels like it's over. And then it restarts with the trumpets, right? And then I saw seven angels and seven trumpets. And so that's, that's what recapitulation is. It's like John brings us right to the end almost, and then he's like, Roop, now we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to go back and describe it again. So even the seven trumpets, right? You read about these seven trumpets, and then in Revelation eleven fifteen it says, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And you go, that could be the end of the book, right? The kingdom of the world is now the kingdom of Jesus. He reigns forever. And then what's the next chapter? The woman and the dragon, and then the first beast and the second beast. And, and it's like John, yet again, doubles back. And let me tell you the story from a different perspective. Even the seven bowls that we're going to look at tonight, um, it, it, you know, we read it. The seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple. It is done. And then the next chapter we're going to look at talks about the great prostitute and the beast and the fall of Babylon. And you go, well, but wait, I thought John just saw the angel say it's done. It's over. And so that's how um, the book of Revelation works. This is why I think... Um, the book of Revelation should not be read chronologically because it makes no sense chronologically. <laughs> because three times already we've come to the very end. Jesus has conquered. His kingdom is reigning. And then we've doubled back and it feels like we start all over again. So that's how recapitulation works. But I, I, again, I want to remind you, there is movement, right? It's not to say that there's nothing... Um, there's no movement towards the return of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Sure, there is, but I don't think it's necessarily as linear as we would like it to be. Um, but there is movement in the seven seals and the trumpets and the bowls that show us that Jesus is coming back and we're getting nearer and nearer and nearer to that. Um, even think about, you know, the seven seals... Um, we're told that a quarter of things were affected. If you remember that um, the, the fourth horseman was given authority over a fourth of the earth, right? And then in the seven trumpets, a third of the things were affected. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of living creatures in the sea died, a third of the rivers, a third of the moon, sun, and stars. And so you see... Uh, that fraction, a third of things, but then you come to the seven bowls and there's no fractions. They're, the seven bowls are pictured as being kind of total, complete. So I think the seven bowls are basically going back and explaining in greater detail the woes throughout the ages, which are all leading up to and culminating in this final judgment. Um, it's like the trumpets were um, incomplete snapshots, and now it's like the bowls are revealing, you know, the full photograph, for lack of a better example. And so what we're going to see, I think the main theme is that these plagues reveal unbelievers' hardness of heart and the fact that the, they are being punished because of their hardness expressed in idolatry because of their persistent non-repentance and because of their persecution of the saints. And you probably noticed it a few times, um, even in the midst of God being just and judging and pouring out wrath, um, it says that 
over and over and over again, uh, they didn't repent, they didn't repent, they cursed God. That's one of the big themes um, in this chapter. So let's walk through the seven bowls um, and just try and make sense of that a little bit. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to keep an eye on YouTube as well. I can't see the comments on YouTube for some reason. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Um, I want to make sure I'm monitoring everything. So if you make a comment or ask a question or something, um, I don't miss it. So so, uh, in the beginning, you see these angels come out, right? And they're given this kind of very... um, powerful imagery. They're clothed in white linen. They've got golden sashes. Uh, And then they're given these bowls full of God's wrath. And it says the sanctuary is filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues uh, of the seven angels were finished. So it's just kind of, it kind of sets the stage, right? That this is like serious what is going on. So bowl number one uh, is described in verse two of chapter 16. John sees an angel pour the first bowl on the earth and it says harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped it. So this first um, punishment is because of people's idolatry, right? We, We talked about that in chapter 13, people who take the mark of the beast, which is basically um, uh, committing themselves to, uh, you know, when, it, when it's, um, the mark is put on their forehead, that's symbolic of their ideology and their theology, right? It's committed to the beast and Satan, and then it, when, it, when the mark is on their hands, it's the, the outworkings of their actions. So, uh, this first angel, it says this punishment is because people worshipped the beast, worshipped the state, worshipped Satan, essentially. And what I want you to notice is that so many of these bowls, uh, these plagues, are they're totally based on the plagues that God did against Egypt. Um, I read one scholar who said basically that these, um, s- these seven bowls, it's like um, John took all of the plagues of Egypt and put it in a blender and then like blew it up to, you know, apocalyptic proportions. Because you'll notice, and you may have already kind of picked up on that, a lot of these plagues that we read about, we go, oh yeah, that's what God did in Egypt. Um, so this is one of them, right? Uh, we're told that painful sores come upon the people who bear the mark of the beast. So that's based on Exodus 9, Verses 9 to 11, it says, um, uh, this is what it says, It shall become fine dust over the land of Egypt and become boils, breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So, this is Moses. They took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it into the air, and it became boils, breaking out in sores on man and beast And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. So um, this this kind of imagery is based on when God performed these signs and plagues against Egypt. And what that was seen as is um, God's people who were being persecuted and God coming and, and redeeming them. And we've seen that kind of imagery and theme throughout the book of Revelation, right? So the book of Revelation is the, the one book in the New Testament that alludes to the New Testament more than any other book of the New Testament. So John, it's like John is constantly going back to Old Testament imagery to explain what's happening. And so these seven bowls are no different. So they have sores, on them harmful and painful sores and it's interesting because it's almost as if the punishment fits the crime these are people right um, who received this mark right in chapter 13 the mark of the beast this idolatrous mark and now one of you know god's judgments is them receiving a penal mark right a mark of these sores on them 
So we need to ask then with these things, are these boils and sores literal, right? Or, or are they symbols? And really, um, they could be literal, literal boils and sores, or um, the sores could represent some sort of suffering, presumably, um, like um, that entailed by the, if you remember the fifth trumpet, uh, we're told that demons like scorpions were given authority to torment people, and most likely that's a mental and psychological torment, not necessarily real scorpions, <laughs> right? And so the idea of, of people having harmful and painful sores, um, it very well could be literal sores, or it could be some type of suffering that is spiritual and psychological um, against people. So that's the first bowl. The second bowl, it says, John sees an angel pour out his bowl into the sea, and the sea became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. So again, ask yourself, like, where have we seen this before? Where uh, God turned uh, a source of water into blood. And again, it's the Exodus, right? Uh, Moses turns the Nile to blood. So in Exodus 7, uh, verse 17, it says, Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. So again, uh, John is pointing back to the story of the Exodus. So this bowl um, could possibly represent or indicate um, famine conditions that would be linked to economic you know deprivation like if everything in the sea dies it would obviously affect food source jobs on and on and on so again will one day the sea literally become blood possibly or perhaps this is god indicating uh that just aquatic life dies the source of income and food and security is taken away i think it could be either so that's the second bowl. Like I said, they're not pretty. Uh, bowl number three, John sees an angel pour this bowl into the rivers and springs of uh, water and they become blood. So that's based on Exodus as well. And then it says, John hears the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one. You brought these judgments for they, he's talking about uh, people on uh, the earth, right, unbelievers, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them what uh, blood to drink. It is what they deserve. So uh, blood is, is symbolic of death and suffering. And so it's interesting to me that from, from the vantage point of God and from his angels and his servants, um, they say, God, you are just for bringing about these judgments. Um, you're not, like, the, the angels are clearly saying, God, you're not being overly emotional or erratic or vindictive. Um, God, you are being just as you do this, right? You are the Holy One. You are bringing about these judgments. So the reason that, that people suffer under this third bowl is that we're told that they, they've caused God's people to suffer, right? That's why they're, they're suffering. And the angel pretty bluntly, right, at the end of verse 6 says, it's what they deserve, right? They've shed the blood of God's people, and now God has given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. The, the punishment fits the crime, and then in verse 7, the altar says, true and just are your judgments. And if you remember, way back in Revelation 6, um, the fifth seal, the martyrs under the altar, if you remember that, they ask God, how long until you judge and avenge our blood? And here we see, right, 10 chapters later, God is doing just that. 
right? In, in, if you remember in chapter 6, right, martyrs ask God, how long, God, until you avenge us? And, and deal with those who have shed our blood. And they were told to rest a little while longer. And then now we're seeing in Revelation 16, God is judging those who persecuted his people. And from the altar, right? The altar says, yes, Lord God and Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So it's as if the martyrs under the altar are saying, yes, finally, God, you have rendered judgment and justice. Bowl number four, Uh, John sees a fourth angel pour his bowl on the sun, and it says the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched with fierce heat, we're told. Um, And the response of people, look at that in, in the end of verse 10 and the start of verse 11. People nod their tongues in anguish, And they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So even as God is doing this, the the people, notice that, the people aren't going, oh God, we're sorry, you know, if you would just stop, we would turn to you. The picture is people just continuing to curse God, refusing to repent. So the language of burning Right? Does an angel literally pour his bowl on the sun? Um, I doubt it. The language is figurative, I believe, um, because even in the Old Testament, that type of language is figurative as well. In Jeremiah 7.20, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, upon man and beast, upon the trees of the field and the fruit of the ground. It will burn and not be quenched Ezekiel 22 says I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath and you shall be melted in the midst of it like did did the people literally melt well well, no it's right it's figurative language as silver is melted in a furnace so you shall be melted in the midst of it and you shall know that I am the Lord I have poured out my wrath upon you so so the 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 idea of you know the sun scorching people um it's probably figurative um oh sorry i realized that i i read under the fifth uh bowl not the fourth bowl but same thing they cursed the name of god and they didn't repent that's not verse 11 that's verse 9 the fourth bowl um but it's probably figurative language um and so i don't know what you know that would necessarily look like like is literally the sun gonna send out rays and scorch people maybe but probably not but what is interesting and sad actually is that this bowl of judgment only brings about blasphemy and non-repentance right it says that they curse the name of god who has power over these plagues so blasphemy really it's it's if you wanted to think about blasphemy, blasphemy is a, it would be like a defiant, slandering, or defaming of the name of the true God. So it's a picture basically of people uttering lies about God and his character. They're blaspheming him, they're cursing him, they're speaking lies about him. And this blasphemy, I think, could even be a denial that all of their afflictions are sovereign punishments from God, right? It could even be a denial that God really and ultimately has power over these plagues. They're denying it and they're blaspheming God who's doing this. They're speaking lies about him. And we're told that they don't repent, right? They did not repent and give him glory. So what you're seeing is a hardening of hearts. Um, When people in chapter 16 are confronted with sin and idolatry and they're facing punishment, even then they don't repent. They just continue to harden their hearts and they hate God. They don't turn to Him. Bowl number five. 
how's everybody doing? Are you sticking with me? <laughs> I know that this is like super heavy and not fun, um, but we'll get to some, some application at the end. Uh, bowl number five, it says that the angel pours out uh, this bowl of God's wrath um, on the throne of the beast. And it says that its kingdom was plunged into darkness and people gnawed their tongues in anguish and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores and they did not repent of their deeds. So this fifth, uh, this fifth bowl, it's, it's interesting that it's poured out onto the throne of the beast. So on one hand, we should go, thank goodness that God is going to punish and deal with the beast, with with evil, right? Um, and we talked about the beast being representative of um, evil and oppressive uh, empires and nations, anyone who, you know, came out from under the authority of God and oppressed and persecuted God's people, and also religious th- uh, institutions that uh, coerced people into worshiping the state. And so it's a good thing that God is going to punish the beast, right? That's good. We should be thankful that God doesn't just let them get away with it, right? Um, This bowl is based on the plague of darkness, right, in Egypt as well. One of the plagues that God did against Egypt was darkness. In Exodus 10, uh, verse 21, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. So we've seen God do this already, right? When God caused darkness to come on a nation who was oppressing his people. And here we have almost like identical, God pours out darkness onto the kingdom of, or the throne of the beast. And there's other places in the Old Testament too that talk about um, darkness as being a form of punishment. Isaiah 8, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Um, Jeremiah 13 says, give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. So lots of um, prophetic language in the Old Testament even uses the idea of darkness as God's punishment. And we saw God do that in Egypt as well. Um, Again, Is this a literal darkness that God sends on unbelievers? Uh, It could be. But also, right, what does darkness represent? I think it represents separation from God. It represents, um, oh, Andrew, when you give a reference, could you give the verse? Yes, sorry, Pamela. Yeah, I'll do that. It was Isaiah 8, 21 and 22. And then it was Jeremiah thirteen sixteen. My bad. Um, I'll try and remember to do that. Uh, Jeremiah 13, verse 16. Um, so, yeah, the darkness uh, could very well be literal, but it also could just be a figurative symbol because darkness represents distress and anxiety, separation from God. Um, it, I think it's designed to remind the ungodly that their persecution and their idolatry are in vain. Um, and so it's like this darkness produces anguish in people, and we're told that, right? They, they gnaw their tongues in anguish. Um, and so, and it hardens people again, right? The end of verse 11, they did not repent of their deeds. And so, yeah, I think just to be encouraged that uh, in the midst of that, it's, it's good that God is going to punish the beast. Um, thank goodness, right? When you read about the injustice and the evil that takes place, it's good that God doesn't just 
kind of let it slide, right? He doesn't leave it unpunished. He does enact justice on that. So, bowl number six. This is the slightly weird one. Um, Bowl number six. It says, John sees an angel pour a bowl on the river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. And it says it's, it's dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And then John sees out of the mouth of the dragon. And then he says the beast uh, and the false prophet, right? That's the second beast. Three unclean spirits like frogs, right? Again, you got to remind yourself. He says they're like frogs. They're not actually frogs. They're like frogs. And he tells us what they are. They are demonic spirits, verse 14, and they perform signs. They go to the kings of the whole world. They assemble them for this great battle on the day of the Lord, which is the return of Jesus. And they assemble in a place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So most of us would read that and go, like, what on earth is happening? (laughs) Like, just weird imagery, Right? The Euphrates, this river is drying up. There's kings coming from the east, frogs coming out of mouths. The whole world is assembled for this great battle at a place called Armageddon, right? So, um, first off, this is meant to, it slightly resembles the drying up of the Red Sea, right? Again, Exodus imagery. Um, the Euphrates River dries up, we're told, and that's. That's kind of what happened with the Red Sea. The Red Sea parts, the, the land dries up, they walk on dry, dry land. Um, in a couple of places uh, in the Old Testament, talk about the Euphrates, but the Euphrates in the Old Testament is just talked about, it's named as the river, like capital R, river. And that's the Euphrates that it's talking about. So in Isaiah 11, Verse 15, the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the river with his scorching breath and strike it into seven channels and he will lead people across in sandals. And Isaiah 7 verse 20, in that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river, that's the river Euphrates, with the king of Assyria, the head and hair of the feet, and it'll sweep away the beard also. So the river Euphrates, or the river, is mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, and then it's mentioned here as well. And what's fascinating is if you know a little bit of history, um, Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, he, in his conquest of Babylon, he literally did this. Um, and so it's, it's like this imagery in Revelation 16 is hearkening back to the fall of the actual nation of Babylon. Um, in, in Isaiah 44, verses 27 and 28, it says, Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill my purpose. So Cyrus of Persia rerouted and diverted the rivers as part of his battle plan um, against Babylon. So you read about this, this great river Euphrates and its water was dried up. It's like John is reminding his audience, the, the, the listeners, of what happened when the nation of Babylon fell. So it's like the, the drying up of the Euphrates is a picture of how the multitudes of Babylon's religious adherents throughout the world will end up being disloyal to it. Um, and so, you remember, like Babylon, right? We're going we're gonna to read later on about the fall of Babylon. When Revelation talks about Babylon, it's not talking about the literal Babylon, right? Babylon became this archetype of any and every nation that opposed God's people and hated God and blasphemed him and oppressed God's people. So at that time when John's seeing this vision, Rome is Babylon, right? But I find it so interesting that John, he gives this reference and this kind of 
subtle nod at when the actual nation of Babylon fell. What's also interesting is that the Romans feared what lied beyond the Euphrates to the east. Um, there was actually, um, there was actually, and I mentioned that, there was this legend that Emperor Nero, right, because he, he killed himself, but there was this legend that Nero actually didn't die and that he was in the east um, kind of gathering up kings and an army to come and battle against Rome. And so isn't that interesting, right, that, that John and God really takes the, the politics of the day and he uses it for this type of imagery, right, that the Euphrates dries up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. That's what Rome was terrified of. And so God says in this imagery, it's going to happen, right? God drying up the Euphrates to prepare this way for these kings. Uh, Baba Ram says, please send me your files. Yes, I will do that, my friend, uh, after this. Yep, for sure. Um, so then in verse 13, you have this image of frogs, right, going out to deceive the world. Um, one scholar I read said that perhaps that's meant to actually resemble um, the plague of frogs in Egypt. Because if you remember in Exodus 8, verse 3 and 4, the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Even in Psalm 105, verse 30, it says their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. So what's interesting about that is uh, if you read in Exodus, th this plague of frogs, uh, Pharaoh's magicians were able to recreate that, right? So maybe, maybe there's this, this uh, hark hearkening back to that plague of frogs that even, you know, these evil magicians and sorcerers could recreate. And so you have these demonic spirits who look like, right, or resemble frogs. And they're going out and we're told that they seduce the kings of the world for war. So it's almost as if, right, they're seducing nations and kings to join Satan, join the beast. And then we're told in verse 16, that there's this final battle, right, on the day of the Lord, the great day of God the Almighty that, that we're told is at a place called Armageddon. Now, there has been so much um, guessing um, and... Um, kind of speculation about where is this Armageddon. Um, so here's the thing. There is no place in the, in the Middle East known as Armageddon. Uh, and people have tried to figure out, oh, it's here, it's here, it's here. Um, there is no place in the Middle East known as Armageddon. Uh, the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew is Har Megiddo or Megiddo, which means the mountain of Megiddo. But here's what's interesting. There, there is a place 60 miles north of Jerusalem named Megiddo, but it's not a mountain. So you kind of go, well, what's, what's going on here, right? It says that this final battle takes place at a, in Hebrew. It's called Armageddon. There's no place in the Middle East called Armageddon. The closest is Har Megiddo, which means the mountain of Megiddo, and 60 miles north of Jerusalem, there's a place called Megiddo, but there's not a mountain. So you kind of go, what? What is going on here? Now, there's a couple of battles described in the Old Testament that took place at Medigo. Um, the battle of Barak and Sisera is described Barak, in Judges, right? Um, in Judges 5, 19, it says, the kings came, they fought, they fought the kings of Canaan at Tanik by the waters of Megiddo 
they got no spoils of silver. So there was this great battle that took place at uh, Megiddo between God's people and then these kings of Canaan. Um, and it's, that's, you know, in that battle, God's people won. Now, the more famous battle took place between Pharaoh, Necho was his name, and King Josiah. And we read about that in 2 Kings 23, verse 29. In his days, Pharaoh, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. So you have this example um, of Josiah where Judah is defeated at Megiddo. And that actually resulted, that was one of the key things that resulted in Judah's decline as a nation and its eventual capture by Babylon. And so what, what's interesting is Megiddo became this proverbial way to describe the place where righteous Israelites were attacked by evil nations. And, you know, every, any Israelite would remember the battle at Megiddo where King Josiah was killed and Judah was defeated. And then not long after that, Babylon came and just ransacked Jerusalem and they went into exile. So I think why John is saying that this battle takes place at Har uh, Megiddo is that he's proclaiming this great reversal of history. Right at Megiddo, God's people were conquered, which led to their exile and destruction, right? Babylon, the archetype for any nation opposed to God, right, ends up because of this key battle where their king was killed, Babylon was able to come in and just wipe them out. And now what John is saying and what he's seeing is Babylon is going to bear the judgment of God at the place where, right, uh, God's people's enemies had conquered them and so so bowl six is is describing some kind of conflict or battle when jesus returns and so the picture that's given it's like satan and the beasts and his demons and babylon which is representative of all nations that oppose god it's like they're gathering to try and annihilate the entire community of faith and it's, and it's a battle where God decisively judges the unrighteous. And we're actually going to read about the outcome of that battle later on in chapter 17. And it comes up again in chapter 19. And it comes up again in chapter 20, right? Recapitulation. The, the, this final battle is described three more times in the book of Revelation. And here's what's amazing. And this is kind of a, you know, a look ahead what, what's amazing about it is that there is no battle. Jesus shows up and it's over. Like, it's amazing. Even like, yeah, you read Revelation 19 and it says that, you know, uh, this uh, white horse and there's this picture of Jesus and the armies of heaven. And then basically the kings, you know, it's the same picture. The beast is is there and all these people are there to make war and then we're just told and then it's over there's no there's no battle there's no like oh man jesus almost lost jesus shows up and it's over which is amazing and that's why i think verse 15 is a call again notice again every chapter what does john tell us verse 15 be faithful i'm coming like a thief Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So yet again, chapter after chapter, we're told as believers, stay awake, make it to the end, right? Be faithful. Jesus is coming back. So bowl, bowl six describes kind of this last battle. But really, I think what John is getting at is this reversal of history where at the place where evil conquered good, now we're going to see the reversal of that at Megiddo, Har Megiddo. Now, bowl seven, uh, John sees this angel pour his bowl into the air, and then a loud voice says, it is done. 
and there's flashes of lightning and there's thunder and there's a huge earthquake. All language, right, that describes God's final judgment. Then we're told the great city Babylon splits into three parts. Babylon is made to drink the cup of God's wrath. Every island uh, uh, flees away. What does it say? Every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. Huge hailstones fell, which should remind us of the hail that fell in Egypt, right? There's another, another clue back to the Exodus in Exodus 9, uh, verses 22 to 35. That describes the plague of hail. Um, and then look at what the result is. People cursed God, right? So I think what we're seeing in Bowl 7 is just the finality of God's judgment. And like, I want to remind you, we've seen this a few times already, right? Seal 6 felt like the world was coming undone, right? There's an, and very similar language, right? In, so think about it. Bowl 7, there's lightning, thunder, earthquake, hail, then you, uh, and then it says in bowl seven, islands f- fled away, no mountains to be found. So flip back to Revelation six. You look at the sixth seal, earthquake, right? Stars falling to, this, to the earth. Mountain and islands are removed from their place. So it's like the exact same language. So I think seal six and seven was bringing us to to the return of jesus and god's final judgment when you go to the trumpets and you get to trumpet um six sorry i'm trying to find it yeah trumpet six it feels like um the earth is gonna fall apart right uh and it talks about an army that's gathered by the great river Euphrates. This is in Revelation chapter 9. And there's smoke and there's sulfur and all of these things. So it, it's such similar, similar language as bowl 7. So I think what we saw, this is why I think the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are just different vantage points. Because we saw in the seven seals, it just led us right up to God's final judgment. But it was from the perspective of the church the seven trumpets led us right up till God's final judgment and the return of Jesus, but it was the perspective of the world. And then this last bowl, it leads us up to the final judgment and return of Jesus, but it's from the vantage point of the throne of God. So it's quite, I mean, the book of Revelation is structured so unbelievably, uh, it's brilliant. And yet, the sad part is we see people um, still not repenting, still hardening their hearts, um, and cursing God. So Ramesh on YouTube asks, which theory should we uphold? I don't think all the seven bowls of God's wrath happened or happening as literal. Should I, shall I be futurist without holding present and past? Is it possible? That's a really good question, Ramesh. Um, and again, like I've said all along, different people hold different um, viewpoints. So my, my viewpoint, I guess, would be that um, we're seeing, the book of Revelation describes things that are happening between Jesus' first and second coming. So there are things that are happening now, but also there's, there's things that haven't happened yet, right? Because we're not to the return of Jesus yet. So for instance, bowl seven, I don't think bowl seven has happened yet. Because it seems like, you know, the last seal, the last trumpet, the last bowl, it seems to be describing the end, right? Jesus returns, the final judgment. So there's, in one sense, yeah, that's still future. That hasn't happened yet. But I guess my stance is not everything in the book of Revelation is future. I think it's um, describing what is taking place in history between the first and second coming of Jesus. It's this pulling back of the veil that describes this is why things happen in the world. But that's a really good question. I'm not going to tell you what position to hold. I'm just (laughs) um, laying out, this is what my position on the book is. Good question, though. So what I, as by way of closing, um, I'll give it a minute for other questions or comments, but I think chapter 16, like part of me wishes this wasn't in here 
because it's, yeah, that's really hard words to hear, right? And I'm sure all of you have friends or family members that are not believers, and you kind of, you kind of go, oh, if, if you're not in Christ, you are under the wrath of God, like, right? God's judgment is going to happen. But what I'm reminded of in, a, a, by way of hope in these chapters is it's amazing to me, right, that uh, in chapter 16, verse 17, this angel says, it is done. And when I read that, it just reminds me of when Jesus right, said almost the exact same thing on the cross. It is finished. And what was Jesus doing on the cross, right? He was bearing this. He was bearing the wrath of God on the cross for us, right? So the last, the last angel says, it is done. And I'm just reminded, Jesus hangs on the cross and he says, it is finished. So one thing that we can be encouraged by by revelation 16 is that the wrath of god it it puts it into perspective what jesus went through for us right god's hatred of sin god's anger at unrighteousness poured out onto his son so the wrath of god has been satisfied for those who are in christ jesus and so really what what it reminds me of is that there's no need for people to go through this because it's salvation is available. I mean, there's a way out, right? Um, there's a way out that you don't have to ever face God's wrath, and it's by faith in Christ. But it's just, again, it's because of people's hard hearts and their hatred of God that they, uh, even in the midst of judgment, just curse God. And so I think it's just a, a good reminder this is why we proclaim the gospel this is why we proclaim the love of god so that people don't have to um, face god's judgment because it's already been paid for so i know it's an intense uh chapter but hopefully um it's that i've at least helped you understand it a little bit and I, i love that kind of from here on out, it's quite amazing because we're getting into just God's victory, God's victory over the beast, God's victory over Babylon, Jesus's victory, right, when he returns. Um, so it just, from here on out, it's like this steady climb of great news, right? We've done a lot of slugging through some of the heavy stuff, and now the book of Revelation just gets really exciting as we hear about how God has... Uh, one. So uh, I'll give it maybe a few seconds if there's any last comments or questions. I was thinking too, um, we've got probably, you know, five or six weeks left. And I don't know if there would be interest in once we're done the book of Revelation. Um, to keep doing these Wednesday nights. Um, but if, if there is, uh, you can let me know. Is there another book of the Bible that you would like to study on Wednesday nights or is there something different that you would like to do? I'm, I'm willing to keep doing this even if we finish Revelation. Um, but just something to think about, right? Because we are, uh, yeah, probably in about five or six weeks we'll be done. Uh, and so we can keep doing something else, right? So just think about that. So if there are are, uh, no other questions, maybe we'll just leave it at that. Um, Like I said, hopefully you're encouraged and um, yeah, that that you understand more. Um, You're welcome, Sherry. Um, But we'll leave it at that. And uh, Babaram, I will send my notes to you. If there's others who would like a copy of my notes, I do, um, I do upload them on the website underneath the sermon, underneath the whatever week it is, um, but I can send them to you as well, so you can just let me know. Um, and yeah, we'll leave it at that, and I will talk to you guys next week. Hopefully you join us on Sunday for our live stream.